Hello and welcome back to All You Need. All you need to make HTML5 games. And this time we're going to do a falling game. So this is our third tutorial in this All You Need series. Uh, the first one was an isometric board and the second one was a side scroller. So you can check those out as well. Let's go take a look at the game that we'll be making. All right, catch passion pods and avoid others. All right, presumably it's a keyboard. Ah, there's keyboard. I'm, I'm grabbing those red ones. Whoa, darn. Oh, darn. So now I have zero. So you're trying to avoid all the other colors and catch only the red ones. There's a red one. There's a red one. Ooh, there's a, ah, yeah, there's a red one. Yeah, nothing like some back, backseat uh, game playing, huh? Whoa, whoa, how about that? Can we get all the way? No, I, oh, I lost two. I don't know. Okay, I give up. And when we get all those hearts up there at the top, we uh, we get a nice reward message. Oh, and it tells us our time. All right, passion pods. So let's um, take a look at what else we got here. If we drop this down, this is built with Zim. So here's Zim. Zim is a JavaScript Canvas framework to code creativity. And it has code creativity. Wonderful. So we can make all sorts of things with Zim. And uh, there is the game uh, banner right there. So you can read about these other things too. But if you click on the game banner, you can see all sorts of games that we've made, uh, mobile apps and Flappy Bird type games, pattern matching games. So uh, there's there's a kind of a side scroller with physics. We went through that in another tutorial and there's the isometric board for, uh, in this case, we made a maze. All right, and there's a leaderboard. We could put a leaderboard on this one too, but we'll leave that to the last of the four of the series where we'll show you how to do a leaderboard. Okay, so this is Zim. If you want to see more examples, under examples, you can see all the things. that uh, These are recent things that have been made with Zim, plus some other sort of complete apps, such as the Alone Droid. There's T-Bugs, a mobile game. Groovity is for kids. And then various collections of things. So we, uh, a lot of the people that use Zim make e-learning apps as well, or e-learning games, and a lot of that is gamified or gamification, so you can find things like that in there. We've got uh, particle emitters, that's good for games. Uh, like we said before, physics, various components as well that can be used in games and controllers, motion controllers. All right, so that's Zim, and then there's a bunch of examples in there as well. Let's take a look and see uh, the tutorial that we'll be following along here. We'll put the link to this in the video, and it is uh, all you need to make HTML5 games. And this one's a falling game. Am I in edit mode right now? I think I am, yeah. So I'd rather not be in edit mode as I go through all of this. So let me just save a draft of this. Mm, how do I do that? Uh, do, 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 do. This is it. And if I'm in edit mode, I don't publish. Do I publish? I don't think I publish. Publish? No, I don't want to do a publish, not just yet. Ah, maybe this thing right here, yeah. There we go, share draft link. Okay, so I'm gonna share a draft link with myself. Copy that, and we'll go to that. My apologies. There we go. All right, so now I can go through and select the code from this. This is the tutorial that we're going through. It's up on Medium. And we, on the YouTube, will publish a sort of friends and fans link so that you can get in here and get to these if you want, and on their forums, etc. So we do have a Zim forum, and you're welcome to ask any, any questions there. All right, so we're going to make this game called Passion Pod. Ooh, and it's a falling game. So we've made lots and lots of falling and catching and avoiding games before. So you tend to catch things or avoid things. And you can change the orientation of this. Right now, things fall from the top and come here, but they could come across the side and you can avoid it with a spaceship and they might be asteroids or they could actually come from all different directions. Who knows? So there's a variety of things that you can do with falling games. And we encourage you, uh, you're welcome to follow along with this tutorial, of course, but we encourage you to uh, try out some creativity and come up with something new with your falling game. 
We do have a simple falling game and a complete falling game. This is the simple falling game where everything kind of falls at the same speed. And there's just you catch the red ones and get hearts and that's it. Um, however, it's uh, sim more simple than this complete game. So you're welcome to take a look at that. In our tutorial, we're going to go through the complete game, though. This is all part of Zim, and there's the link to Zim. We already showed you Zim briefly. We have two choices. Well, maybe more, but we could code in a an editor, a desktop editor, such as VS Code, and that's what we're going to do for this tutorial. Or you can actually code this if you want in the Zim editor. As a matter of fact, let's press on the Zim editor now. I'll just show you that. This is another one, Eternal Orbs. Oh, that's a preview. Uh, we must have been working on that one. Let me go find the current one. So uh, this is the Zim editor. I'm logged into this, which means these are all my files here. And I'm going to look for the game file that looks like a falling game, but not the simple falling game. I'm going to go to the... Uh, see orbs of order no the passion pods passion pods here it is okay so we've loaded passion pods in here and you can you can find it as well there's a link to it and when you do you can find the code right here and the code will show you the code in this window and you can copy the code over into this window if you want or just look at it and type it yourself in here so this is the Zim editor. It comes with what's called the template built into it. So we have a template and the template says, put code here. And really the template's all up here. We can't see it. The template's all at the bottom. We can't see it. And this is the put code here part. <laughs> so the template is very, uh, the template that we're going to be using in VS Code, very similar to what's happening in the editor. It's just in the editor, the template's already built in. And in the editor, when we want the game mode, so we're going to be uh, using something from the game mode, maybe the timer, I guess. And so we've checked the game mode here. And in the editor, or in the uh, in VS Code, we'll have to import the game mode. All right, so there you go. That's uh, just a little bit of a look at the editor. If I were you, I would come in and do a sign in. You hit the login here, you can sign in. That allows you to save your files. There's all sorts of examples in here that you can take a look through. As a matter of fact, I just saw that I made a list of a game challenge thing, and so I could have found the games that way as well. All right, uh, but you'll start with a whole bunch of things full advanced. These things expand open, and you'll get to see all sorts of Zim examples. And once you load it in there, there's layers with group transforms. Oh my goodness, what are we doing here? We're picking up different parts of it and Okay, wow. Eyes. Let's grab the eyes and move the eyes. Okay, so, and if you wanted to see the code, there's the code that did the layers. And this little arrow would copy the code over into where you actually edit. All right, that's the idea. That's the editor. And once you're in here, we still have the, you know, our version of the passion pods in here. I hit test and it's running this code over in this window now. Or you can see it in full screen etc. And there's a guide if you need help. All right. Blobbity blobbity blah. Let's uh, pop on back. And all of this was talking about the um, difference between the editor and stuff. Uh, but we still have to get the template. So yeah, let's go grab the template. The template is in in Zim, on Zim, in Zim code. That's the editor. I don't think I need that open anymore. Here's Zim. And right up top is the code there. And that is the template. We're going to copy that. We're going to drop down our browser and paste it into VS Code. So this is VS Code right here. It's from Microsoft. It's free, easy to download, and uh, very quick to install. Uh, your files and folders go on the left-hand side. We have a folder called Tutorial. It takes a little bit of getting used to how to get that there, but uh, you probably managed to do that. Or you could just hit new file. So once you're in, you can hit new file there. Or if you have a folder for it right here, new file. And I've called it falling.html. Oh, now we should call put, put in the title here. Passion, passion pods falling game code creativity. This is what will show up at the top of your HTML browser as a title. And this is the template right now. Let's see what the template looks like. So I'm going to right click and say open in default browser. 
There's also open with live server, but you won't have either of those if you've just started your VS code because they're what are called um, extensions. So these boxes right here are extensions and you can just do a quick search for open in browser. It looks like that open in browser or you can find live server, maybe both of them and install them. It just takes a second to install them and then you can right click here and say open with browser or open with live server, open with browser and there it is. So this is what the template is showing us and I'm going to drop this down and you can see that as I squeeze this like so, oh, it's a bit confusing because we got passion pods going on in the back. I don't think we're going to need that anymore so we'll get rid of these guys and just look at this. Okay so as we squeeze or change the size of the browser here the frame right there that's called the stage or the frame is fitting within the browser window and that makes it quite easy to code because we know the dimensions and we handle it as in a sense responsive design that you got going on here. All right so we don't need this purple circle uh, but there is the code for the purple circle and see how it's inside of this frame ready event right here. Uh, there we are importing zoom we'll talk a little bit more about that but within this ready this is where the editor is. All this stuff in the template is up above in the editor that you can't access and all of this stuff is down below in the editor you can imagine. And so if I take the circle and copy this oh did I close my editor? I did didn't I? And I can find it again. So not the forum but zim and go to the editor. If I hit clear now yes that's me starting off with a new one and see that I just pasted the circle there and I hit test. Ah all right, so everything inside of this ready event right here is already, that's what will go in the editor. All the rest of the stuff already given in the editor. Okay, so let's follow the tutorial, shall we? I don't need that anymore. We don't need the circle, so there's somewhere it's going to say, hey, get rid of that circle. When we do and save it, so I've saved that file and I refresh here. I could just leave both of these things open save this, refresh there. When I do, uh, there's no circle there anymore because we took it away. And this thing's called the stage, this gray area, and we can change the color of the stage, but maybe we say that in the tutorial. So we're going to pop on out. Here's our tutorial. And scrolling down here, there's all the instructions, what I just said, in case I did it too quickly for you. Many people will already know how to save files, but there are some that don't, and that, all that might have been too quick. And there's a bit about the gray box and the template versus the editor, but we already looked at that. Making the game! Yeah! All right, so for this game, we're going to use the Zim game module, and that will give us the timer. Otherwise, it's the same as Zim, except it adds more stuff for game. We use that for the isometric board that's in the game module, the leaderboards in the game module. So if you need those things, we bring in the game module like that. We're also going to change the frame to black and darker. I thought we went to darker on that, but uh, let me have a look. Oops. Um, back here. Yeah, right. And so up above, zim underscore game, or you can copy that code. So that brings in the game module. And then that was black. And I think I usually like it when I go black. I usually go darker here. Those are Zim colors. Darker is almost black. Dark is a little bit less dark than darker, <laughs> etc. If they don't have, if they don't have uh, quotes around them, then they're Zim colors. If you wanted to, so here is the HTML color red. It has quotes. And if we come back here, oh my gosh! And the Zim color red has no quotes. So if we take off the quotes. That's the built-in Zim color red, which is a little more tomato-y touch, touch off the red there. All right, we don't want red though, we want black. And of course you could have put in quotes, number sign CC000 or whatever, 0000. Okay, you can put that in quotes too if you know, wanted to do it that way. So here's the ready function. Uh, great. So when we've got a stage and we're all ready, we're given F for the frame, S for the stage, W for the width of the stage, 
H for the height of the stage. And what are we doing again? <laughs> oh yeah, falling game. <laughs> all, of, all of this setup, and I almost forgot what tutorial we're doing. All right, and speaking of tutorials, let's just bring this back over here. Let's see what else we got. If you're in the editor, make sure to check the game on, and that's how you can set the frame color in the editor. Because we, we don't have access in the editor to the new frame, you see how in here we went new frame? Well, that's hidden in the editor, so we can't change the colors there, but you can change them afterwards with an F dot color equals black. So that's F for the frame dot color equals black, yay. All right, so add a greeting message in a Zim pane. And this will mean that uh, to, to be able to use the keyboard, we gotta move this uh, paddle around. We're gonna do it with the keyboard. There's other options as well. We could do it with the mouse or with a, uh, a D-pad, for instance, or a joystick and a motion controller. So there's other options as well, but we're going to use a keyboard. Um, to get keyboard access or to play a sound, we've got to interact with the canvas first. That's a rule so that the canvas can't intercept people's keystrokes without them knowing it. Uh, so that's fine. That totally makes sense. All right, we're not playing a sound in this game, but in other, other tutorials, you'll see sounds being loaded. Uh, but in this one, we're just playing it quietly. <laughs> uh, okay, so when the pane's closed, it's gonna call play game. And this is what the pane looks like right here. So let's copy this code right here. Copy, and come on over and paste it right in there. If you've done any of the other tutorials on that document, if you've done any of the other tutorials, you'll know that this can go a little bit lengthy, um, like a couple hours maybe, an hour, hour to two hours. This one's a touch shorter. I expect it will come in around an hour, but you're always welcome to put it on pause and go get some cookies or whatever it may be, uh, and then come on back to it. But make sure you come on back to it. Try and complete the tutorial. It gives, it's wonderful. This, this coding stuff is just wonderful. I've been doing it all my life. Absolutely love it. It's the best puzzle in the world and you can make really fun things. You just gotta stick with it a little bit. Okay, we're very easy to use at Zim. Um, let me just pop out here. Words of encouragement, that's what we're giving you now. Zim right here, uh, this is Zim. And if we go back to the main page here and scroll to the bottom, ooh, here's how much code we use in Zim compared to how much code the rest of these things use. So with Phaser, Phaser is a game engine. We're coming in, we did an example that did the same thing as for the Phaser at 63%, that's almost half. And most of the stuff is under half. We're coming in at 37% the code of all these other competitors. So what you're seeing here is a very easy way to make these things. We provide a lot of conveniences, components and controls the controls are fun things like particle emitters and parallax and a, a pen and you know, just animating to sound. Okay, so uh, there you go. And if you want more, you can read some reviews, etc., and see that we're giving you, we help kids make these things. We're giving you the easiest way possible to make this stuff. I've been in the industry for a long time using Flash, even using Director and making CD-ROMs before that. This is as nice a system to code in as you will find. All right, there you go. <laughs> That's the encouragement, so stick with it. Don't think it's hard because it's not as hard as elsewhere, <laughs> right? Anywhere else is gonna be harder. Uh, so there you go. And if you want more schooling on that, I, I do teach, we've got workshops. Uh, there's a whole learn section there, but I also teach at Sheridan. So you're welcome to come to Canada and join us and uh, pay whatever, 8,000 bucks. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> then we'll teach you. Okay, so uh, coming on down here, what have we got? Let's take a look at what we made, a new pane. This is like a pop-up window. The content of that is catch passion pods and avoid others. It's going to be white. We're giving it a background color of red. This keyboard access right here, um, if you are in a, an iframe uh, and we want to make sure that we can get the keyboard strokes, unfortunately, clicking on the canvas or interacting with the canvas does not activate the keys in an iframe. 
<clears throat> it, it's not a Zim thing. It's all can. It's a canvas issue. I don't know if it's a bug in the canvas or a privacy thing. So we have added here, and this won't do any harm if we open it up here. But if you're in the editor, you need to turn this on. So this pane is special. When it sees the keyboard access, what it does is it takes away all pointer events on the canvas so that when you press on the pane, it clicks right through the canvas to the iframe. And then we capture that event saying, oh yeah, we clicked on the iframe, yay, you get your keyboard stuff. And then we put the pointer events back on the canvas. So it's um, a little trick that we did, yay. All right, anyway, that's the pane showing. When we close the pane, it will call that function right there. That's called a callback. We also have an event system. You could have put the pane into a variable like my pane or start pane or start. Then you could have said start dot on close, call this function. Uh, that's kind of a two-step process. So then we develop this one where we just put a callback in there. This is the function that will get called when we close the pane. And we're gonna call that play game. If you wanted to, you could put what's called an arrow function in there. I don't know how much JavaScript you know, but there's an arrow function. A lot of developers are lazy and they might just do that and put their whole app right in here. Okay, that's like an anonymous function, except it's a new one called the arrow function. All right, but we're not going to use that. We're going to just use a named function called play game. And here is our game. All right, good. So, in other words, we should see now, if we test this, save it first, see that little white dot up there? That means it's not saved. Now I have control S and it's saved. And we open this up. It's no longer going to be red, I hope. Okay, there we go. So, catch passion pods and avoid others. And when I hit enter, not much happens. But if we look in the console, that's F12. There's playing game, all right? That shows up there in the console, yay. And if we want to see that again, if I refresh, playing game, okay? So the console, F12, if you're on a laptop, it might be function F12. You should find it with the, the hotkey. I see a lot of people going right click and inspect. And when you go inspect, you don't come to the console, but it is here, right here. And so I see them inspect and then go to the console. That's a two-step process. Just get your F12 going and you'll be much happier throughout your coding life, okay? All right, anyway, so what's next? To the tutorial again. Oh, there's a picture of what we saw. The pods. Add the following code to make an interval. An interval happens in time. And we're gonna make a bunch of Zim circle objects and animate them from the top to the bottom. When they get to the bottom, we'll dispose them so that we don't, they're not around. All right, so the following action could be done by increasing the Y property of circles. So Y, X and Y, X is to the left to right from the top corner there. And then Y is from the top corner down. Um, so those are our position uh, properties. So you could do that in a JavaScript request animation frame. Do you like that? Request animation frame. Uh, but we use a ticker and a ticker can add a function called a ticker, or a, well, we use a ticker to add a function to a queue. And that's the same as a request animation frame, except we've got it built into Zim and other things like Zim animation and dragging things, uh, stuff like that, will use that same ticker queue. And at the end of that single ticker queue is a single stage.update. So if you use a ticker, uh, you're sort of piggybacking on any, anything else that Zim is updating the stage on and it's more efficient. Every stage that update will drain batteries. So we don't update automatically. We don't do anything unless it's needed. Other places like 3JS, for instance, they have a request animation frame updating constantly and it can possibly lead to battery um, but th th that's because the 3D world is often moving, you know. 2D worlds, you're not always moving. Sometimes you're just looking at stuff. So that we learned from Flash. Flash drained the battery. We said, no, we don't want to do that, okay? Anyway, pods. So here's the pod stuff. Uh, the other way we can do it is use Zim Animate. So what we're going to be doing is rather than hard coding or manually coding all this stuff, we'll use what is in Zim, and that's what can make this easy. So there's the Zog, we don't really need that anymore. And the rest of the code is going to go right inside of here. So I'm gonna paste all that stuff, what a mess. Don't leave your code like that. Uh, you can right click and say format document. 
like that. And now it indents. Every indent, you see this indent right here? You see that line that goes down there? Think of it like a box. So from that bracket to that bracket, all of this stuff is in that box. So basically when we play a game, it's going to do everything in, the, in that box. When we call the interval, here's another bracket right here that goes to this bracket. This is the end of the interval. So whenever we call the interval, it does everything inside that box. Here is an animate, and it's going to do everything inside this box. So these boxes are there to help you understand your code. I'm a little bit too indented here. I don't need to be quite this indented. So maybe to, because I'm showing very large code, I'm going to kind of uh, shift tab. So I selected all that, and I've shift tabbed that back a bit so that, well, mind you, I'm going to reformat pretty soon so it won't <laughs> it'll, it'll go back into uh, the wrong place again in a moment however we can close the extensions we don't need that open anymore okay so let's take a look at this code that we put in here's the play game const pods we have a new container and we're adding that uh, by default that's to the stage oh yes we could add it to other containers too so containers hold a bunch of stuff and you can have containers within containers, within containers, within containers, etc. It's a way that we can organize things so that the stuff will all move together. It will all fade in together. We can remove it together, etc. It's just a bit easier. So we're going to put our pods. These are the things that are falling, the little circles. We'll call them pods. We're going to put our pods in a container. And that way we can do things like loop through that container and test to see if any of them are hitting our paddle. You see how that's handy? If we put it loose with everything else, uh, then we'd be looping through the pods, but we'd, or, you know, we'd be looping through that, but we'd also be looping through things like the title and the score and the paddle. And we don't want to loop through those. We want to only loop through the, pa the pods. If you're coming from other programming places, it may sound a bit like an array. An array is a way to keep a track of a list of things, and we can loop through the array. Here, when we're dealing with display objects, that's things that can be seen, we usually put them in containers and then just loop through the container. See the difference? Okay, good. So we've got this container. By default, that will be added to the stage. And we're going to um, say that we don't need to worry about rolling over or clicking on these pods because we're only testing to see if they're hitting the paddle. Uh, this is a bit of an efficiency thing on older mobiles it may help but otherwise you probably wouldn't notice it works fine without saying that but if we don't have to click on it then why are we uh, then we can say don't worry about this and and that helps zim be a bit more efficient okay so down below here is our interval right here there is such a thing as a javascript interval which looks like this set inter vol like that then we put the function so often it will be an arrow function and you start working on your function blah 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 this is what it's going to do in the interval and then you forget to add this other one down here which is how long it's going to be so that's how long your interval is and i would say about a quarter of the time i do all this stuff and forget to even set a time and have to go back and it's very frustrating not only that we do a lot of things in code um, for instance, if we have an event, here's an event right up here. Oh, that's not, <laughs> darn. Uh, we used to do an event. We used to say, hey, const frame is a new frame. And then we would say frame dot on ready run this function. And you see what I just said? So if we said const f is equal to, and then we say something like f dot on ready, call this arrow function comma, call this arrow function, bing. All right, you see that? When we're gonna loop, we're going to we're gonna say container, say our pods, if that's the name, pods.loop. Um, or actually, if it were, I guess we could do it this way too, loop, comma, pods, like that, comma, call this arrow function, like that. You see what we're doing? Um, when something, 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 call this arrow function. Something, something, call this arrow function. And that's very common. The JavaScript set interval is the reverse. It's not set interval 1000, call this arrow function. It's reverse. And it's like, eh. 
is kind of annoying. It's the only thing really that is sort of reversed like that and for no reason really. There is a reason. If you, if you don't apply a time, it takes the smallest amount of time. So they said, oh, you know, maybe people won't want to leave that blank like that. I have never in my whole life left an interval time blank. So it's a pretty pathetic uh, reason. Anyway, that's also in milliseconds, which is okay if you're a programmer. It's not the best if you're a kid. Kids don't want to be thinking about milliseconds. So these two things, and plus some other advantages that we have with interval, we said, nah, we're going to switch it and make our own interval. And for our own interval, we put the time first. So this could be one second. So uh, for every one second, call this arrow function. I better go up and get rid of these things before we forget, huh? <laughs> Why doesn't this work anymore? <laughs> all right, so I think I got all those, yeah, back up there. So we're down here in our interval. We could say, yeah, one second. So every one second, call this arrow function. That's basically what we're saying there. That's the end of the interval. Inside the interval, I had some other things there, but we can undo and find that again, and we'll talk more about that. It's another advantage of the Zim interval that we'll see. So here we are going to make a pod. There's a circle and we'll make it 20 radius and it could be any of these colors. This is called a Zim V value or a dynamic parameter. Um, normally we would put you know, one thing in there, red. Okay, this would make a red circle every time. However, we want a bunch of different circles to fall. Oh, we're in an interval, so it doesn't matter too much. We could have made an array of colors probably outside the interval, something like const colors is equal to, and put the colors in here, red, green, yellow, etc. I'm gonna have to undo all this anyway. And then we could have picked randomly from that, and that would have been fine. Because, yeah, so in here we could, we use a zim pluck. That's the easiest way to get something from an array. Pluck colors like that. All right, so that would have worked. Um, where this doesn't work is if you're, say, tiling something or uh, emitting a bunch of circles. If you're going to tile something, you are going to tile uh, a circle. And you can't then pluck the color and put that in the tile because it's not running in a loop. This is running each time we have the ability to pluck and that plucks, which basically is getting a random thing from there. If you're emitting the same deal, when you pass in the parameter to the emitter, you've only got one chance. You say, here's what I want you to emit. And so we can't pluck anything there. So we were kind of stuck. And what we did is we built this things called dynamic parameters where we can actually pass in what we have there. Well, that's a lot of typing that we did there, huh? Almost there, surely. There we go. All right, so uh, what we decided is we said, hey, if we pass in an array, we will make this, the circle, when it gets made, it will pick randomly from whatever that is. Isn't that cool? So that's really handy. And so in other words, if we pass this circle into an emitter, every time the emitter goes to make a circle, it would just pick randomly. If we pass it into a tile, as it tiles that circle, as it makes copies of it, clones of it, it will just pick a different color each time. Okay, isn't that cool? There's also a thing called a series. So Zim V values can be more than just that. Here's a series. And here you go. <laughs> trying to get the round bracket. Oh, I still didn't get the round bracket. Where is that round bracket? It's a tricky one. So now what we're doing is every time we run, we'll pick the next thing in the series. It'll be yellow, red, blue. So actually, we may have to set that series up here in the interval. But if we were passing that into an emitter or into a tile, more so, it would be the first one would be yellow, then it would be red, blue, silver, gray, dark. Then it would go back to yellow, red, green, etc. So Zim V value is very handy and it makes Zim quite powerful powerful all right anyway we don't want a series there's a few others and we'll probably see these as as we go uh, as a matter of fact if we undo a little bit more oh i have to undo through that stuff too to get what we had in the in the interval again almost there i can see it ah there we go okay so we had this in the interval right here. 
Can you guess what that is? That's another Zim V value. This is called a min max on the Zim V value. And what that's doing is it basically saying each time we do the interval, pick a number between 0.2 and 0.5. Isn't that amazing? Think about it. That allows us to make an interval that doesn't always go at the same time. And we want that for games. We don't want something to fall every second or every half a second. That's boring. Oh, look, something's going to fall again. I know when it's going to fall. Here it comes. Oh, here it comes again. Oh, here it comes again. Oh, here it comes again. You see what I mean? So this allows us to make things fall in a range of time. And you can adjust that however you want. And that's more possibly like real life, probably like real life. And so this is a range zim v value and if you think about an emitter a uh, particle emitter like emits these particles if you always emitted the particles with the same force it would kind of keep on looking the same blah 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 but if you pass in a min and a max of the force you can make the particles go different distances as they emit and so again there we are using a zim v value as we're defining our particle emitter um, so that's another format of a zim v value, a final format would be a function. So if you pass in a function there, it would take the results of the function. So that's kind of cool. You could have a function that checks the time or does something different, and then your intervals will relate to that. Uh, imagine a series. We've got an interval here with a series. You could play music in time like so your series would be a series of times that would play in order and then you play your notes uh, that cool okay so that's the power of that and that's built into the zim interval it accepts a zim v value there so we're sending these pods what are we doing with them we're locating them randomly across the width so w is the width of the stage zim rand will pick a number between zero and w or if we wanted it uh, width divided by two comma. So this would pick a random number between half the width and the width. <laughs> Everything that's falling would fall on the right hand side, <laughs> which isn't what we want either. Okay, but uh, by default that's zero like that. And then we uh, are setting the height to minus 100. Minus 100 is up above the stage. Why don't we just so that we can see what's going on, set them to 100 and that we'll see it and we're putting it in the pod right so we're we're locating the pod right here at a random width at 100 now 100 pixels down from the top and we're putting it in the pods container right there uh, then we're animating and our animating uh, this looks a little complicated let's just do the y to start um, so we're animating the properties of y to the height of the stage plus 100. Oh, let's make that minus 100. <laughs> that way it'll start 100 down from the top and it'll animate to 100 above the bottom. Okay, we're making the ease of that linear so that it seems to just be falling constantly. We're setting a time. Okay, normally we would have a, a simple time like three like that, except here we're saying, oh, do it a min of two and a max of five. So that means everything that's falling will be at different speeds, or most things will be at different speeds between this range, between that time it will take. Okay, well, what do you wanna do? Let's, uh, we can undo this, hopefully. We'll make them all fall at three seconds. When it's done animating, call this function right here. And this function receives a target, so that means that's whatever animated. So that's kind of handy. We receive that, we pass it into the arrow function, and we're going to dispose the target. That's a way that we can completely obliterate that circle. We could also say dot remove from, and that would remove it from the stage. We wouldn't see it anymore, but it would still be alive if we needed it again. We don't really need it again, so we're disposing. I just hit the save there, and we're coming back to our app and refresh. Catch passion pods. Okay, so you see how they're all popping in at 100? And look at where they're going to. They're all disappearing just before they get to the end. So there's all of our pods popping in. 
slightly different times. Not always at the same time. Sometimes they're too closer together. Sometimes there's a bigger delay. If you wanted to see that even more, we could say, how about 0.1 to uh, 2.5? And now you'll see a bigger sort of variety. Definitely slower, isn't it? And you're going to see occasionally some will come in right close. Other ones will be there. Those two just came in close. Okay, so that's uh, definitely adjusting it. We, we don't, that's kind of boring, isn't it? Where was it? 0.5 like that, 0.2. Um, what else were we looking at? Let's adjust the values here. So this is off the screen. So minus 100 is up above. And this is off down below. Plus the height plus 100. And now you'll see that they, they come in nicely. All right, there they go. There are the falling things. They're all going straight down. And what we did is we said, okay, maybe we don't want to go always straight down. Uh, by the way, other properties can go in here, like alpha to zero, comma. So can you imagine what will happen there? We're animating the alpha property from one, which is what it is, to zero within that time. Let's try it out. Oh, look, they fade out as they as they go down. Okay, they, they still have to go to minus 100, but yeah, they're fading out as they go down. Um, if we wanted to do their scale instead, scale, we could do scale to zero. Let's see what that looks like. Or scale and alpha to zero. Oh, they're getting smaller. Okay, or a scale. <laughs> okay, I don't know about that. <laughs> Uh, now that they're going too big, we can see them actually deleting because they're only going to minus 100 here and we can see the tops of them getting deleted. Anyway, that's um, so we can animate more than just one thing at a time. Uh, we could animate their color. Let's make them all go to red. Okay, by the time they get to the bottom, the bottom's really under here, but you can see that they are all trying to go to red, and by the time they would get to the bottom, they would be red. Okay. Um, what happens if we do something like rewind? Oh, there they go. They were red. Oh my goodness, they're coming back up and changing. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd want to be playing this game. <laughs> okay, so there they are going back up and back down. Uh, anyway, we don't want to rewind. And there's a loop as well. Actually, we could have maybe just looped on it and played the same ones all over again. But you see how easy Zim Animate is. If you compare that to certainly CSS animation, it is just like 10 times easier than CSS animation. Uh, it's certainly on par with Greensock. Greensock's the leading animation tool uh, for HTML. And Zim has most of the, you know, if not all of the features that Greensock has, plus extra ones as well. And Greensock has a, a couple extra ones that we don't have. Um, but anytime we see one that they have, we usually try and incorporate in, in here. All right. Um, so what did we want to do, though? I'm getting hypnotized by my uh, things offside. I better, better refresh that so I don't see them. Okay, so what did we change there? Anybody remember? <laughs> Tell me. Oh, the time, right. Yeah, there's something in the time. Why don't I go out to the tutorial here and we can just maybe grab that. Uh, I think it's the time again. Yeah, like that. Copy. And put it in here. So it wasn't three, but a min of two and a max of five. And now when things fall, they'll be falling at uh, different rates. So some will be falling faster than others, see that? And that makes the games a little bit more challenging. You have to watch out for the ones that are falling faster. And we're only trying to collect the red ones. Are we still, we're still animating <laughs> to red, okay. We're only supposed to collect the red ones, so we better not animate to a color of red. And there was something in here as well to do with the X, so let's see that. It was in the animation. Doot, doot, doot. There it is right there, X. Okay, 
So what that is, we're going to animate in the X2, and if we put animate 100, that would animate everything to an X position of 100. Can you imagine what that would look like? <laughs> so 100 is kind of like 100 pixels over is something like down here in the corner, and sure enough, all of those are animating to an X position of 100. But that's not what we want to do. We want to animate them to a relative position, 100 over from where it is. So this is plus 100 from where it starts. So now you're going to see everything slightly animating, straight down mostly, but oh, save it first. Save. And we'll see everything animating straight down mostly, but a little bit to the right. So everything is starting up here and animating down here, but 100 pixels over from where it started. And so they're all kind of looking like they're slightly windy and going a little bit to the right. If we said 200, well, <laughs> 1200, definitely. There, 300 over to the right. Now it would look quite slanty. Okay, it's animating 300 over from where it was. What we're going to do is we're going to make it animate some random number 100 over to minus 100 over. So in other words, some are going to be going this way, some will be going that way, some will be going straight down. And that again makes it a little bit more challenging. Uh, the problem is, is we have to use a string here. So it's pretty easy to get a random number, rand minus 100, comma 100. So that will get a random number between 100 and minus 100. Okay. Um, including ones that are very close to zero. So if you didn't like that, you could do this approach as well. You could say 50 <laughs> or 49. You could say 50 to 100, but that's always positive. And then here, I think it's the next one, true. And I, that might be integer though, whether it's an integer, I think this one is null and then true like that. Anyway, what this does is it takes both the positive and the negative version of that. So this would be 50 to 100 or negative 50 to negative 100. And that way we always are getting a certain angle. I don't really care about that though. I don't mind ones just going straight down. So I'm going to choose negative 100 like that uh, to 100. And some of those will be closer to zeros. However, that is absolute. This whole thing is absolute position. Remember our very first one where we animated to 100? That's kind of the same thing. But if we turn this into a string, the problem is it's not easy to, you know, you can't just go like that. There, it's a string. However, we can do what's called casting in JavaScript, and that's string and put all of this inside there. So that does with casting. You take the, the name of the class, the string class, and say, whatever's in here, I'm going to make a string. So it takes whatever's in this random number and turns it into a string. And that's what we had in the tutorial. That's just a bit of raw JavaScript. Now, when we refresh here, we get uh, the pods going different speeds. And also, they, look at that yellow one coming in, and this other one's going out. And so they're coming in at different angles. And great, we've got this weird sort of pod storm happening here. <laughs> All right, yay! So some fine tuning going on there. Let's go back to the tutorial now, see where we're at. This is pretty plain for a game. At least we have random times and slightly random directions, but we'll add some more features later to make it more unique and exciting to play. All right, because right now it's still on uh, your classic falling game. The paddle. Let's do the paddle now, though. Right, we're going to use a Zim Motion controller, and we could have made the paddle with a keyboard event. So uh, the frame, dot on, key down, and we could find out which arrow we pressed, or the W, or D, W, A, S, D, W, or the A, or the D. Um, and, uh, you know, it can manually do that. But we're going to use this thing called a motion controller, which makes it quite easy for us to deal with. So I'll copy that, and we'll come back here. That's an interval, and paste. And here I go to right click to format document. All right, so there's the paddle right here. We're still in the end of the play game, so everything should be within the end of the play game, I think. 
And our paddle is a rectangle, 100 wide, 30 high, and white. We center the registration, and, and that will center it on the stage, but also center the reg. Oh, we don't need to do it that way because we're positioning it after. So probably it would be better to use reg, although either way is fine, center. This is a newer way where we can easily center the registration point. Registration point is uh, the point about which an object will rotate, about it, which it will scale, and about which it gets positioned. So it, it will get positioned at the registration point. We're going to be putting a boundary right there. The stage is the boundary of our paddle. So if the paddle had its register, rectangles usually have its registration point at the left. Oh, let me just show you this uh, dot, put it down here, dot outline. So dot outline is a way in Zim that we can see what an object looks like with respect to its boundary and its registration point. So down below here, we have the paddle and there's its bounds right there, the red thing. This round circle is where the registration point is. And basically, I don't know, I don't, uh, that doesn't move with it because it's a snapshot in time. But as I move the paddle, half of it's hitting the edge. That's where the boundary's working on the registration point. So it can go half off. And on that side, it goes half off. Right? So compare that to when we don't center the registration point. I'm going to save this and refresh here. So now the registration point's at the top left corner where it usually is. And are you ready? Now when we move this, it goes all the way off. And on this side, it, it doesn't go off at all. So you may want the paddle to be like this, where it doesn't go off. And then when it gets over on this side, it doesn't go off. And, <laughs> and we can certainly do that. It's just uh, we have to make a custom boundary then. And that would be going in here. We haven't even looked at the motion controller, but a new boundary like that. We would say 0, comma 0. Then it would be the width minus the paddle's width, which is paddle dot width, comma, and what else is with the boundary? Zero, zero, I guess this would be um, the height. Okay, so let's try it now. We refresh here. Now when we move this, it hits on that side and it hits on that side. Okay, see that? So we made our own custom boundary so that it stays within there, but it's a little bit of calculation. Oh, we had to subtract something. All right, so just for the ease of it all, we put the stage there. <laughs> Where's the S key? Is that right, or do we add an extra bracket? I think we got an extra bracket in there, maybe. Okay, so for the ease of it, we set the boundary to just the stage like that, and we're centering the ridge because that. Will work out all right let's go back up to the paddle though so we center the registration we position it mm, what's this null for that would normally be the position in the x zero i guess would be better so we position it zero in the x 40 up from the top or from the bottom sorry because this is from the center zero from the center and 40 from the bottom that's how it works zero from the center 40 up from the bottom and we don't need to outline anymore. There we go. And then uh, our motion controller. So a new motion controller, we say work on the paddle, make it work with key down. So here's what it would work if we didn't put anything in there, null. Let's not have an access there, null. All right, uh, as a matter of fact, this is, there we go. <laughs> All right, here's a new motion controller for the paddle. Here's what happens, refresh. Play the game. Still in the same place, but now whenever I press, I'm using my cursor, it's moving to where I press. So that is the default motion controller. Go to wherever you press the mouse. Okay, and you can change the speed of that. Then there's things like mouse move, like that. Now it's a little bit different. We refresh here. Now it follows the mouse. So if you wanted to, we could make it like this and it follows the mouse and you collect things all following the mouse. Ah! Okay, or if you were pressing down with your finger, you can make it work like that too. There's a press move as well. And that's how we often draw with a pen. We'll have the pen follow where, when we're pressing. Okay, it could also work with gamepad. So uh, game stick. Okay, game 
button. I think that's the the arrows the arrows of the gamepad. But game sticks usually used for motion. But we want key down. No, we want a bunch of other things in here as well. <laughs> but key down. So here's key down. We refresh here. And now I can use the arrow up, the arrow left, uh, both of them together to get sort of diagonal movement. And so now we haven't limited this. I can just move around everywhere. There's no boundary, so I can go right off the stage, etc. So there, if you want your game like that, you can do it like that. However, we've said that there was a speed, I think a speed of 15, and maybe this one was horizontal, horizontal. Uh, let's just see what we had in here. Horizontal, yeah, the way we usually do horizontal now is capital, all capitals for is on tall. I see a few things that we want to change. <laughs> Will I remember them? <laughs> They're very minor things. Uh, let's see, what was it? We had a null in there instead of a zero. Um, but anyway, uh, horizontal, all capitals is the same as quote horizontal, smalls. Right, that's those are constants. We're using them there as well. That's the same as center, small like that. But we often use and same with bottoms and anywhere else you see big capital letters like that. All right, so I think that's it. And then we wanted to set the boundary of the stage. There we go. All right, so that's our speed. This is hey, please make this horizontal. That's the axis that it will work on. And here's what we get. Refresh. There she be. Okay, and it goes out. I find that actually handy. I can kind of hide, <laughs> hide a little bit more. <laughs> if the wrong color is coming, I've got a little bit of hiding going on, although you have to watch it because it will probably still hit anything that's sort of off the side of the screen. So that, you know, that's just as easy and it, it's fine. Okay, so that's what we're doing. And we're looking, we're trying to catch the red ones. All right, so what's next? The indicator. What do we have an indicator for? Is that the hearts? So we're going to use a Zim indicator to keep track of the score. Oh, yes. It looks like these hearts right here. So let's copy that indicator code right like that. Hopefully you guys are doing okay. We're almost at the hour. Uh, the hour. Uh, we have been talking a little bit uh, about uh, options with features, I suppose. But that's probably good. If you're going to make a game, hopefully you're with us and enjoying this. We're showing you some options that you can then explore. If we kept on just showing you what our code was and didn't say anything about the options, you know, it could make what we did, but you wouldn't know um, different possibilities. All right, so we're pasting that in there, and we are formatting document. Okay, so there's the indicator. That's one of the, there's maybe 40 components, almost 50 components in Zim. Indicator is one of them. And we're going to set it so that it fills. Uh, by default, that's that doesn't happen. Uh, let's comment that out, for instance. It'll have six. There, we'll give a width. We'll give it a selected index of three instead of minus one. And uh, sure, we can still use hearts if we want. And we're putting that somewhere. We're positioning it. 60 from the center and up in the top. So basically just off center. There it is. So you see how the heart normally in indicators says we're on the zero one, we're on the fourth one. It kind of says, hey, what level are we on? This level. <laughs> okay, but the hearts, we want them to fill in there. So the indicator has a fill setting. And there we go. And there's the fill setting now. So that's the difference there. Normally, we're not using hearts. Quite often with the indicator, it looks like this, which is a bunch of little circles, <laughs> which make it confusing considering we're dropping circles. So uh, yeah, we're kind of uh, making it hearts and imagining that all the red things we collect increases our hearts. You can set any emoji you want there, although you'd have to say a new emoji, but we have some built-in ones as well, the, you know, common ones, stars, hearts. I think that might be it. Uh, but you can also set a square or a rectangle or something like that. All right, and uh, there's probably other possibilities too, but that'll do for the indicator. Of course, we could have used a text score like uh, Zim's got a game module with a score, which is really just a label that we can keep track of the score easy. And it's got a timer, which is a label with some special stuff added to it. Speaking of timers, here's the timer. And it comes from the game module. Let's copy that. And then we'll talk about what that code's doing.
All right, a new timer. Uh, this one again is a little bit modified because rather than counting down, which we usually do, although that actually could have been a game as well. So the default timer looks like this. Well, we'll keep the background. Uh, I don't mean to. Okay. Here's the default timer. <laughs> Save. And that looks like this. Okay. And it counts down from 60. So one minute counting down. And when it ends, there's an event, a uh, complete event, I think. I mean, we, we don't have to watch it. Should we watch it? Yeah! <laughs> That's one extra minute. One extra minute on the video. Uh, in this case, though, we're going to start at zero, and we're going to set the down false so that we're actually counting up, and we're going to change the background color on that. We're scaling it a little bit uh, to match the hearts a bit better. We could have scaled either one, I suppose. And we're positioning it 50 from the right and 44 from the top. Uh, top is default top. It's just that's default to left. So same with when we did here, top was default. So we could put the top in, but it doesn't matter. And you can also put it on the bottom. So that's the pose. Pose positions around the edges or sometimes around the center if you want. And now it's down there at the bottom. Okay, see how easy that is? And when it poses it, it puts it the distance from the edge to the edge of the object. When we loke something, quite often we loke things. There's loke and pose. Loke locates the registration point. Okay, so pose positions how far away it is from the edge, but loke positions or locates the registration point. And we can't go to the right or the bottom with loke. It's just loke, loke. That's it. Anyway, we don't want it on the bottom. Top is default, so there's our timer on the top. And we'll use the timer as our final score in a sense. So if we had a leaderboard, it's who can get the let do this in the least time, who can collect all those hearts in the least time. Alrighty, so there's our hearts, there's our timer. Great, we're ready for a hit test. And Zim's got a dozen hit tests, maybe, or sorry, half dozen. And here's some information about hit tests. So there's hit test point. Hit test point will test to see if a point is hitting this weird shape. You can imagine a, you know, like a blobby weird shape or uh, a PNG of a character and a lot of it, the, the PNG around the edge is transparent. That wouldn't count as a hit test, but the actual character pixels would count as, as a hit. On a point, there is no weird character hitting a weird character. So you can't tell if two people are actually hitting but you can, um, because that's like too intensive, the calculations on that. So what we've done is we've added, based on this, which CreateJS gave us, that single hit test point, we've added a bunch of different types of hit tests, uh, hit test rect. And what that does is it puts points around a rectangle and sees if any of the points around the rectangle are hitting the weird shape. So that allows you to test if rectangular things are hitting a weird shape. Then there's hit test circle. We put points around a circle. Are any of those points hitting, and one point in the middle, any of those hitting something weird? Hit test path, we can put uh, points along a blob or a squiggle. A blo those are weird looking shapes, but just around the edges of them. And check to see if any of those points are hitting a another weird sprite or shape or picture. Okay, so those are all um, color based. Is there a pixel color underneath the point, which takes a little bit longer to calculate. Um, so before we calculate any of those, we do a bounds check. The bounds say, well, are those two things, are the bounds of them, that's the, the box around them, are they hitting? And if they're hitting, then check for this hard stuff. And that sped up Zim. It's like, yay! It was about three years into Zim. We said, you know what? We shouldn't even bother checking unless they're bound. <laughs> as soon as we did that, the hit tests were faster. It's like, yes! Ah! Anyway, there's other calculations. So hit test bounds, check to see if two rectangles are hitting, and it's a calculation. It's not based on points. It's fast. And same with hit test circles. We do a calculation based on the radius. If two circles are hitting, that's fast as well. Um, hit test circle rect. Is a circle hitting a rectangle? That's also a calculation. And as a matter of fact, doesn't that look like a handy one? Because we've got circles and a rectangle. So we're going to use hit test circle rect. It's a calculation based and it has to check every one of these circles that's falling. 
all the time you know like 60 times per second it's checking all of these circles so it helps to have a calculation yay and then the last one is hit test grid if you're doing pixel drawing like drawing a bunch of pixels don't do a hit test any other hit test on uh i don't know the the bounds of each pixel or something like that just do a hit test grid it's the fastest for that kind of thing and improves your pixel drawing there's lots of tips for hit tests. Hit tests are important in games. One of the things is if we're giving scores, like imagine we were giving scores, and if this thing's hitting, it's going to constantly hit unless we take it away. So sometimes that uh, happens, and all of a sudden scores go way up, or sounds, if you play a sound when you hit, if you don't remove it or do something, it's going to keep on hitting, hit, 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 and play that sound. All right, so anyway, there's tips like that in the zim tips right here okay uh, let's just click that uh, this jumped into the hit test but if we go up to the top here's a bunch of tips these are it's almost like an faq uh, any problems that as we've been building with people any problems that they have we put in here what happens if an object is missing how do you how do you load images what what tricks are there for images what is chaining uh, you know etc 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 all right, and so you can press any of those and get some excellent tips. It's also a glossary of Zim things in there. Uh, the tips, by the way, if you go back to the main page and hit the gold bars, all that does, gold bars right there, whomp, brings you down to the bottom to our gold bars. And there's the tips right there. So if you want to find it yourself in Zim, front page, or any of the pages, hit the gold bars, and there's tips. We also have our vids that links to our YouTube video. Hey, that's that's where we are. Wow. Uh, way to share code. Go back up to the top uh, again for high school or college, whatever. We've got school. We've got kids. Uh, and then there's an intro. All that stuff's in the gold bars of Zim. All right. So here's the hit test that we're using. Right. Copy this and we'll bring it in and talk about it. You having fun? We're almost there, believe it or not. <laughs> um, yeah, we got a couple fancy things that we're going to add after, but this will do all the scores. So let's see, format document. This handles our indicator scores and here we go, okay. So we need to test all the time. If you were dragging something around like an eraser and you were wanting to erase a bunch of rectangles on the page or something like that, you could do this hit test in a press move, okay? If you want to just throw something in the garbage, you could do it on a press up. Do the hit test just on the press up. But here, when this game is falling, we constantly have to check to see if we're hitting. Therefore, we're going to use a ticker. If we want to remove the ticker later, which we do, then we store it in a variable so that we can say ticker dot remove this ticker right here. <laughs> All right, so that will... Each thing that we add to the, the ticker, this function that we're adding, we can remove that function from the ticker by using this variable right here. Otherwise, if you don't have to remove it, you could have just left it like that. Okay, but when we stop the game, we're going to pause all the things that are falling. So ticker.add, here's the arrow function that we're adding to the queue, all of this stuff. And in that, we are looping through all of the pods. So pods.loop. We're, the pods are all the circles. Each time we're given a circle. All right? So we're looping through all the circles 60 times per second. Each time we get a circle, and then we want to see if that circle, hit test circle, we're using hit test circle rect. Look at that. So you put the circle on this side. The pod is the circle. Is it hitting the rect? And you put the rect on this side, the paddle. So is the pod hitting the paddle? If it is hitting the paddle, then we're, oh, then we test. If the pod dot color, so if the color of this pod is red, then we increase the selected index of the indicator. Indicator has a selected index property and we're going to increase it by one. In other words, we get a heart. Else, take the indicator, selected index, and subtract one from it. Oh, okay. So isn't that cool? If it's a red one, we increase the indicator. Otherwise, we decrease the indicator. 
and we're going to remove the pod. Actually, we could probably dispose the pod. Dispose the pod. That gets rid. We're not going to use it again, so we will dispose it. Oh man, I got to go through this and update the. Uh, this falling code probably has existed for quite some time and modify it as we go. So I've made lots of falling games. And in the past, uh, we didn't use dispose, we just remove from. And then in Zim 10, we really went through our memory and figured out how to make sure that we got the most out of memory, like cleared all, everything. And so dispose came along and uh, this is the better way now to dispose it. Yay. One important thing though, bum, bum, bum is when we loop through a container, and this is actually the same thing for an array. If you loop through an array and remove, like pull the index out of the array and collapse the array, you always want to loop backwards because otherwise your, your index numbers get mixed up. Okay, so when you loop through an array and delete, or, or, or in this case, a container, when you loop through a container and are removing things, loop backwards. We know that. We know that. So we made it easy. In our Zim loop, the next parameter is loop backwards, please. <laughs> All right. So we've been doing this for years and anything like that, you know, like, ah, oh, we got to loop backwards. We just made it easy for you. There you go. True to loop backwards. All right. Good. Hey, that's it. That's our ticker. We're doing that 60, 60 frames per second. So we save that and come on back here and let's see what happens. Uh, all right. Oh, I was wondering how we, how we got made so many hearts already. Here I am losing those hearts that I got. Every every wrong one, I'm <laughs> losing my hearts. There's the right one. I got it. Okay. Uh, so I'll try and oh, will I get that one. Oh, I didn't get out of the way in time. Oh, no. No, no. There's two more. I missed it. I took my hands off the controller. I'm a loser. All right. Uh, we want to adjust our hearts up here because I think we gave us too many to start. <laughs> It gave us six hearts to start, huh? It's not bad. Um, what was this? Minus one. So that means no hearts. You can't say zero because this is the index. That's the, oh no, the num six. It's right here, three. So we want minus one on that. The selected index starts at zero. If, if we had zero, we'd have one heart already. So minus one means no hearts. And the indicator of the heart. Okay, I think we're good. So we come back over here. What excitement. Oh, code excitement. Yeah, there we go. All gray. Can I get that one? I don't think I can get that one. This is a good game because it, it kind of uh, treat, teaches patience. A little, <laughs> where are my red ones? And also consequences. It's like, can I get that one? Oh, yes. You know, do I want to risk getting that one? Whoa, look at how fast that's going. And I got it. That's amazing. I'm going to go for a record. 23 seconds. Can we finish it? You guys are, stop playing games. We're in the middle of it. Oh, no, I just lost one, but I got two here. We did it. Okay, but we did it. However, we don't know if the game has ended. You see, we got all those hearts, uh, but we have to put in a conditional. If the game is in, like if we've got all the hearts, that's a conditional. So just sort of think about that. Oh, if I'm saying the word if, it's probably in here. And this would be when we would know right here, when we catch a red one. So probably the next thing we're going to do is open this up right in here. And we want to do a test in here to find out if we've reached the maximum. So let's uh, follow the instructions here. Coming on down. Winning. Okay, when we win. So right in here, uh, let's see. I guess we did it outside of the conditional. We set these plus or minuses. And then right here, we have an if statement. So... Copy that. Could go in either place though. If I put it in the winning and format. If we hit a red, then that's when we can win. So this would be the more efficient way, I suppose. Uh, I'll keep it like the way the tutorial was. By the way, with a, an if statement, you don't need to do the squiggly brackets. If you've just got one line like this, you can just put the one line and it will assume that's what you mean, else that one. And what we did is we stuck the, the if statement back outside here, which is fine. So if indicator.selectedIndex, so however many hearts we have, is double equal to indicator.num. So the num is the total, six. 
but the index only goes to five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Six things, but starting at zero. So you have to minus one from this side or plus one to that side. So in other words, if we're full right there, then we're going to do this stuff. There might actually be, and I forgot to look, there might be a property in the indicator or an event that says when it's full, uh, do this. But anyway, this is easy enough to figure out. So then we're winning and we're going to remove the ticker. So once again, we ticker class dot remove whatever the ID we collected. We're going to clear our interval. The interval is where? Enter. So we're going to clear our interval. Often we don't need to clear the interval and then we would just do an interval like that. But if we store it in a variable, the results of that interval call, then we can clear it like so, enter.clear. From the inside, by the way, you can clear an interval from the inside as well. If you ever wanted to stop this interval on the inside, what we do is we collect an OBJ there, an interval object, we call it. And then at any time we say we animated something, we could say OBJ.clear like that. And that clears the interval from the inside. There's a few more things that you can do with OBJ as well. You can count, you can find out how many OBJ.count is how many times it's gone. You can OBJ.pause, so you could pause the interval and um, reset the, the, the number, etc. So anyway, that's the OBJ, but we're not using it on the inside here. We're going to clear it on the outside. So that's down below here. Clear the interval. Also stop animate. That stops all of our wiggling things and falling things, I guess. So this one stopped the hit test. This one stops uh, making pods. This one stops animating the pods. This one stops the timer. <laughs> so sorry, they're all different names. <laughs> it might have been a bit more consistent there. But the thing is, we, are, we inherited clear. Intervals get cleared. That's what they did in JavaScript. So, you know, that's it. Um, anyway, whatever. You stop a timer. You don't clear a timer. You don't remove a timer. You know, so it's whatever. Okay, and then we present a pane. Passion pods collected. We make it red and white. That's the background color, font color. And then we show it. And when we close it, this is the function that gets called when we close. We reload the location. That's a JavaScript reload. Or you could, you know, could do whatever you want, but that's a quick, quick, lazy way. <laughs> to restart your game. Yay. All right, so that's what happens when we win. Uh, why don't we make it easier so we can test it? Why don't we make it easier to win so I don't have to collect so many of those? And where was that? I'm probably making you seasick here as I go up and down. Number six, how about number two? All right, so all we have to do, <laughs> do, do a number two here. All we have to do is collect two things. <laughs> <laughs> there. Uh, by the way, those are spread apart because it has a certain width. So if we wanted those to go closer together, we'd have to set the width of the indicator to be smaller. Okay, here we go. There's a red one. There's a red one. We win. <laughs> All right, that was easy. And there it is. Passion pods collected and 11. I wonder if we want to put our score there. Uh, I thought we did, but maybe that was on some other one. Anyway, yeah, I think we'd want to put our score there. Oh, I remember where it is. <laughs> it's like way down here at the bottom. We're going to do a couple other things. But way down here at the bottom, we talk about assets, a conclusion. Our very last thing is... Sorry, not driving properly. Our very last thing is add the time to the existing final message. And it's because I had forgotten to add it before. So really, we probably should move this up. I expect we'll, we'll this is a draft of our tutorial here. We got to go back and do some adjust. We'll probably insert this right uh, right here right now. Let's do it. Okay, so there she be, and I believe I copied the whole line. The only problem is this whole line might wrap. <laughs> Passion pods collected. Two new lines right there. That's a those are breaks. New line. Then time colon and put in the timer's time property. So whatever the time is at, we ask the timer, hey, what time are you? Time. Okay, and that's concatenation. That means join the timer's time to this. You can also use templating uh, right in here with something like 
dollar. Well, we'd have to use back ticks. Okay, never mind. All right. I just want you to know if you're coming from a JavaScript background and you know about templating and are huffing at me going, why don't you insert that with templating? You know, I know about it. It's just, I find this just as easy and I'd rather not. Uh, okay, there we go. So, um, 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 where did our example go? It's down here somewhere. There it is. It was underneath our code. So we refresh here. Let's catch passion pods and avoid others. We've got to catch two red ones. And that's one. Oh, I see it. There's another one. That looks easy. Ah, uh, there we go. That only took seven seconds. We should make a leaderboard. And have a seven second. Everybody would look at me going, oh, how did you do that? You must have been lucky. So there we go. And when I press it, it refreshes the page. And we're starting over again. Cool, huh? All right. Well, hmm. Good. Let me as well put that back to whatever it was. Number two, it was six, like so. And we're on our last exciting bit of the passion pods. So, oh, uh, we have a title. What did we do? Passion pods collected. Okay, so here we are, the title. Uh, this wasn't really the exciting bit. <laughs> Here's a label, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look at that label. Sometimes, if you don't know how to do some text on the canvas, then this might be exciting for you. There we go. Just tap that in. Here's our title. Passion Pods. That's the font size. Here's the font we want. We could go out to Google Font very easily. Uh, you'll see that in other tutorials. So, so check that out. And normally when we do label or uh, logos, you want to use a custom font. Or at least do something to it. Don't just leave your font the plain. If you want your game to seem Twice as good, I am serious. Twice as good as it is. You've got to make sure that you have a custom font for your logo. Spend a little bit of time on your logo and it will seem better, <laughs> right? If you have just a boring, plain old logo, it's, uh, you know, it's not good. This is not a great logo at all. Um, usually to get a better logo, you would want a font there. And to do that, maybe, just talk about it. If you're up here, the next thing here is what assets to load. And we can say Google font, like that, underscore Roboto, like that. So that will load in Roboto. And they might have other assets like pictures. If you have other assets too, they all go into an array so that we can load a bunch of things. There also might be a path, but we don't need to, the path is the next parameter, but we don't need to worry about the path. Right, so that's Roboto. I remember Roboto doesn't really look that much different than what we're using. So down here now, you would put in uh, Roboto. You don't need the Google, the GF on the front. All right, and now if we look at this, it won't be, uh, did we even see things? So I guess that's Roboto. Yeah, it's probably Roboto. It looks a little bit different than what we had. All right, but you could choose any Google font in there and uh, have, uh, more exciting font. Google font, just search Google font, find Google fonts. There's a whole bunch of them, whatever the names are, you can use. In this case though, in our example, we left the font null. Oh, that's bad. Um, by the way, in JavaScript 6, null now doesn't trigger default values. You would have to put in undefined here. So maybe we should tutorial that as well but I hate it. undefined is twice as long as null zim is built in es5 so it doesn't care null will trigger default values so we're welcome to still use null there <laughs> yay uh, rather than a twice as long but anyway back up here we don't need to collect roboto well, that's how you would bring in a custom font so if I save this up let's take a close look at our passion pod see if we see any difference yeah this one's a bit fatter looking. I actually like it better than Roboto in this case. Um, Roboto, you know, I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. What? That's it? Oh, man. Why isn't it made out of robot arms or something like that? <laughs> you know, why, why don't all its little uh, things move about? Why isn't this like an accordion arm or something? Man, that would be cool. Anyway, uh, what we did with Passion Pods is we did it twice. We've set a style of bold. We could have gone way over here and done bold. Did I tell you about Zim Duo technique? Uh, I didn't really. 
No, I'm sorry. Okay, so Zim's got two ways to do parameters. One is the normal way. Let's find one with the normal parameters. <laughs> I see one with one parameter so far. Here, okay, normal parameters. There's a motion controller. The first parameter is what are we controlling? Then the key, or the, the type, then the speed. Then So we have to do these in order. And if we wanted to get to the the whatever that is, the boundary, but we didn't want any of these, then we would have to go null, 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 or undefined, 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 right? So that's the normal way to do parameters. But Zim's got a second way to do parameters that was invented in Zim Duo, which is version two of Zim, Zim Duo. So we call it the Zim Duo technique, do you like that? And that is a single parameter that is an object literal, okay? Which means in here, we would put the names of the parameters. And then we can put them in any order we want. We could take the number and put it down here. Okay, we can flip the order around or we can skip things. Like there's a lot of stuff that we haven't even put in here. And that's the object literal, a single object literal or parameters in order. The Zim Duo technique, amazing. This makes Zim so easy to use in that respect. And we were so happy about it. For eight years, we were, oh, we invented the Zim Duo technique. Yeah, come to Zim, this is easy. And then my kid said, Dad, that's what Python does. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't use Python. And so I looked it up, and sure enough, Python has, has the way to do that. So Python, you can say, uh, if, if this were the boundary, you don't, wouldn't need any of this. You could say, bound, boundary equals, spell it, equals stage. Okay, so that's Python's technique of doing it. But JavaScript doesn't have that ability. You have that ability in JavaScript when you accept parameters, like uh, when you receive information. This is the, the way you do the default. But you don't have it when you're um, setting them or like when you're passing in parameters or the, passing in the arguments. Okay, so anyway, there you go. A bit about Zimduo. Down here, though, uh, we don't use either. See, we want to get to variant to make this thing look a bit fancier. And variant, it might be the eighth parameter. So I didn't want to go null, 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 null and get to that. So I didn't use the squiggly brackets here. I did a, another technique using style. So Zim's got style on the canvas. We're the only framework with style. And that allows us to take any of the parameter names and put them up here. Doesn't that look a lot like the object literal that I was just talking about? That's right. We built style into Zim in less than a week. It took us less than a week to build CSS in Zim. Isn't that cool? Because we already had the we already had the configuration objects. And by the way, you might say, "Oh, you're copying CSS." We're not. We've had object literals since the dawn of coding. CSS copied us. It's because code programmers made CSS. And when they did, they said, let's use these brackets like we do with object literals. <laughs> so it's actually the other way around. <laughs> Yay. All right. Anyway, uh, we're applying style so that we don't have to. As a matter of fact, we could have done more to the style here. We, since it's both says passion pods, we could have said the, the text here is passion pods. Copy. And we also could have said that the size is 46, comma, and then there's two colors. So you can drop this down, for instance, here, here, here and here, and it looks even more CSS-y. And you can also say this only applies to a label, label. Because right now, those styles apply to anything that has bold text size or variant. So now that is only labels. We'll get that. We can also put what's called a group on here. So if you say group is something, then we can apply styles to those group names, much like classes. We didn't want to use the word class because we use the word class for other things in, in programming. All right, so that's style on the canvas. Oh, then we wouldn't need anything in here. Uh, red and pink are there. So what do we do with red and pink? You ready? We say uh, color, colon, series, red, comma, pink. Check that out, huh? So do you see how the Zim V values are handy? Now, the first thing that gets, first label gets made will be red, the next label will get pink. 
And this series is really powerful. You can go forward and backwards. You can randomize. You can mix it. You, there's a, a bunch of different things that you can double steps. You can do it twice. So this is much easier to conceive, I think, than nth child in CSS, which is a nightmare as far as I'm concerned. Uh, maybe it's because I don't use it enough. And now you just get rid of this. And like that. And everything is done in style. And when we refresh, it's still passion pods right up there. Okay, refresh. Passion pods, all of that is made the same way. Isn't that cool? Maybe we should put that in the tutorial. I didn't want to scare anybody a lot. And we don't need the label. The label is... Uh, um, once the style gets set, anything that gets made after will get this style. So sometimes we want to say style equals quickly bracket. And there's other things you can do with style too. That's the same as there's a style class, style class that we use dot clear on, for instance. Okay, that would, that would also clear your style. And there's other things that we can do with this. We can remember styles. We can uh, bring the styles back again. We can uh, add things to our the current styles, etc. So this was a set of things right on the style class to help out um, our sort of raw way of doing it. That's a raw object literal. But I prefer using the raw object literals. And we just don't want the style to be anything anymore. There, there she be. Okay, all these, and, and, and that's, do control, there, oh, tab, there we go. Um, so that would also work just fine and make sure that nothing else beyond here, this is the end of the game, so it doesn't really matter, but that would turn off the styles. Okay. All right, I think we've um, played around enough there. That gets us our logo. Do you see what we've done though? We kind of made it, uh, almost look like a drop shadow, but not quite because you can see through the rest of it there due to its alpha right there. If we alpha that a little bit more, you can see the effect, I guess. I, know, I can't. Is it because the second one has the alpha down? Don't I want the first one to have the alpha down? This is the one on top. I think that's what I intended there. <laughs> Mm, can't tell. Now it just looks like uh, maybe the two colors are too too close to be able to tell. So the, oh no, the first one's the one underneath. Okay, sorry, sorry. That the one underneath gets made first, and so we don't want that alpha down. We definitely want the second one here, which is the one on top, bring its alpha down. And what do we got? Okay, what? Um, that was our attempt. We, we might want to rotate that, although we want to center reg that. So dot reg uh, center dot rotate a little bit, um, 10 degrees. <laughs> yeah, I think that's too much. Why didn't that center reg? Reg center position alpha rotate reg center Oh, we uh, no, we rotated it there, and we positioned it. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure that something happened in there, but I don't really want to rotate it anyway. So I think we're good at it. But that that might make you something more fun as well, or add even a couple more and rotate it in. These are just little fast ways that you can make your logo look a little bit more exciting, uh, especially if you didn't use a custom font. <laughs> there we go. All right, so if we take a look back in here, we're on our last step, adding uniqueness. More about this. We're going to do a couple final touches that makes our game more unique and fun to play. There are lots of options. I would say at least 10, 12 options right off the top of my head that you could do to this to make it more exciting. Because like I said, I've seen a lot of falling and catching games. Um, but these twists took five minutes to do, or think about and do, and we're going to apply them in not, just these three lines right here. So I'm going to grab those three lines and add them to the pod right after animation, I think. Yeah, there's our animate. We're going to wiggle them, and we're going to do this other stuff right here, and you will see the magic that we get from that. Okay, so that was up in our pod. Pod, pod, pod. There's pods. Here's the pod being made. Animate. So this is on each pod. Watch. 
we're going to, you see how we're chaining this on dot loc dot animate. We got another one we're going to chain on, but you don't want to chain on. Here we go. Uh, I don't know if it'll be able to format the document. It can't probably, oh, it did. You see this dot wiggle. It's not properly chained because we left the semicolon there. So you want to make sure that that's gone because we have the semicolon here. So that's dot loc dot animate wiggle semicolon so what a wiggle does is like animate but it's going to wiggle x about its current location if you don't specify a location uh, it's just whatever the current location is a minimum of 10 in the x and a maximum of 100 in the x and a minimum of 0.5 and a maximum of one this is the time so this is the the property amount and this is the time Basically, it wiggles. It's just like little wiggles. It'll move back and forth within this amount of time. If you set this to one and one, then it would go one second, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second. All right. But doing it what we had, which was 0.5, it's sort of like a little bit different. And the amount is different. If you went 100, if you went 100 and one and one, you may as well just animate it. Although it's still a little bit different because it's starting from where it is animating 100 over and back to where it is but then 100 back that way so it's a way to animate from the center of something you see that's not quite the same as starting off here animating 100 coming back to here okay coming back to the start position we're in the middle it goes some that way goes past the middle goes some that way so that can still be handy but anyway we it's better when it wiggles so let's see these wiggles in action shall we so 10 uh, back there those are the wiggles uh, why don't we look at the wiggles without doing that and we save that sure all right here we go whoa all of a sudden it's like okay what a lot more energy huh just from that one little line and that's amazing now i feel like i'm on some sort of ski slal slalom slalom or something <laughs> or ski slalom all right, so there's some wiggles. Did I try, I didn't try getting some red ones. Where's a red one? Let me see if this still is working. Yeah, I can catch a red one. Okay, and there's another red one, another red one, and I get some blue ones, and that's bad. All right, so it's still all working. That's the wiggle. The next thing is visually. I was, like, when this happened is I went to take a screenshot of this to for the tutorial, and I went, uh, this just looks like a bunch of little small dots. It's not very impressive. It's not, it's not, maybe I need to bring in some graphics. Maybe these things shouldn't be just little circles. And certainly we could have done that, uh, bring in graphics to this. So this is definitely something that you should change in your game. Turn these into graphics, asteroids. And we have a, a section here, just down below here. Boop, 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 boop. Section down here about assets. All right, so we'll get to that. Oh, darn, I showed you what they looked like. <laughs> okay, I was supposed to surprise you. Uh, but I think you remember maybe we played the game right at the beginning. And here's the next change that we made. We said, well, okay, what if we made um, some circles here? We'll make them clear. And the border color. So this is the color of the circles. Oh, well, actually, we have other options. But we're making it much bigger in radius. See, our pod is only 20 in radius. This one is 100 in radius. It's going to be whatever color the pod is, and that's the border thickness, too. So this is the border of it and the border thickness. And we're centering it on the pod. That means it's just going to go wherever the pod goes. And then this circle, we're changing the alpha a little bit down, and we're centering that on the pod. And this one is even bigger, but with its alpha down. And are you ready? This is what we get. Oh, it's like, yeah, that's much more visual, isn't it? And we're on the canvas. You see how quick that was? And yet it's so visual. And, oh, I got a red one. Uh, no, oh, there's a bunch of big score on the red one. But now it's, it's a little bit, whoa, watch out. So when I saw this, that's great. What would maybe be better is if the circles didn't follow exactly if they sort of got delayed. And you can delay this kind of stuff with a thing called damping. But I just went, okay, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, or you can start, you can set the registration point off on them and you can spin them. So 
there's a variety of things you could do. For instance, if we say dot reg, this is on the middle one. And normally there, there would be reg center, but we could say reg uh, 50, 50 will be the center. We can say reg zero in the X and, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, 30 in the Y. And let's just see what it looks like. So now they're not right in the middle of the center. So they're gonna be off. You see how that's off? But what would happen if you rotated it then? So we take this, let's drop this down. And we go dot animate, or we could have wiggled the rotation. Uh, we'll probably want to loop. So I'm going to go to the Zim Duo technique because looping is way the heck down there. So that means we start with squiggly brackets. Then we have to put the name of the parameters. Props is rotation. And we'll rotate to 360. So that's a full circle in amount of time. And you can make this time random, but we'll just go in, uh, I don't know, five seconds or somehow, maybe a bit more than that, three seconds. And then we will say the ease is linear. Uh, usually when you rotate something, you want it to be linear. So it'll just spin around without slowing down at the beginning and, or speeding up at the beginning and slowing down at the end would be our default ease. Uh, and then loop true, colon true. All right, so there we've just added animation to that. And with its registration being off center, this is what it looks like. So you see that, how it's sort of rotating around and kind of looks like we could make it a little bit faster or indeed random times. And so time, uh, this is time min of um, one and a max of three or something. So that'll be almost like it was, but a little bit more random. And some are like hula hoops or something. And I kind of like, do I like those little hula hoops going around or, or is that just too much? And I, I, I thought it looks a little, gets just a little bit sloppier looking. And so let's back out of that and go, nah, I don't need to do that. And we'll keep the, the pod a little bit, um, keep them centered on there. Okay, but that's how much fun it is to sort of play around with things. We could have also made them emitters, which emit particles coming out. It's like all sorts of options that we can do. Anyway, back to the game, just a little bit about assets. How are we doing for time here? We're sitting at an hour and 40 minutes, uh, which is okay. I was kind of expecting an hour and a half, but we did a bit more exploring, so that's good as well. And we already fixed that one. Assets. So we've just used Zim shapes for our following game. Often you use pictures, even sprites. Sprites are animated pictures, like, uh, I don't know, uh, flying little flapping dragons or something like that. If those were, if that's what we're following, then that would be a sprite. And there's ways to bring in assets. That's pretty easy. So uh, if you're in the editor, we would you have to use frame.load assets right here. Uh, and here's an example in the editor of loading in an asset. So this little guy right here. And if we view the code of it, Frame dot load assets. Sorry if that's small. Therefore, if frame dot load assets, these are the assets we're loading. It's a picture in a sound, and here's where we're loading them from. When the frame is complete, then you call this function start or put all that in a arrow function. Okay, this is how you do it in the editor because we can't load them in the frame. And it says here normally we load these in the frame because in the editor you don't get the frame. The frame's up and Okay, so that was describing that. But when you want to load assets in the uh, in VS Code, for instance, we do it right in the frame right here. So there's where your assets go. Here's the path to the assets right there. And then you have a preloader here, like a new waiter. Uh, waiter, if you want one, we'll give you a waiter. Or if you want a progress bar, progress bar. All right. So an array of all of your images, the path that they come from, or fonts or sounds, images, fonts, sounds, etc., And that's how you load them in. Once you load them in, you can say, give me a new pick, give me a new odd, A-U-D is for a sound, and you can then play that or center the pick or what have you. Okay, so that's assets. We got a bunch of assets that are out here in 
Zim Assets. So just click that. There they all are. And you can press any one of those or press this thing and magnify it. And that gives you probably a view of what these assets are called. Look, a bunch of asteroids. Okay, so if in here, there's also lazy loading. Lazy loading actually means you don't have to preload, but uh, if you're professional, you should pre. If you lazy load each one, every time you lazy load an asset, it's actually preloading it in behind anyway, and it's just more preload calls rather than a single preload call. Also, lazy loading won't work with things like sprites and some things where you have to like tile something. We need to know how big how the dimensions of it. You can put the dimensions in in the lazy loading, but it's almost not worth it. So it's just best probably to do your preloading. It's not very hard. Lazy loading really is for kids. Okay, so if you're not a kid, <laughs> if you're a kid, you made it this far, you've got good concentration. <laughs> But anyway, uh, yeah, lazy loading. Um, anyway, that, that's fine. We, we want to bring it in here and work with those. Anyway, that's not going to work for us, is it? So get rid of that. And back to the tutorial. Uh, oops, did I close the tutorial? No, there it is. So there's an example. If you want to play around with that, that was loading this asteroid right here. In the frame, we put in a couple asteroids in the assets and we told it the path was that and all of a sudden right here new pick we say what the asteroid or what the picture is we center it and we got that asteroid cool <clears throat> one thing about assets though is zim tips if you press on the tips right here in red we'll get a cores error that's why we tend, when we're teaching, we tend to avoid this a little bit unless we're really doing a long workshop or teaching a whole course because of these cores errors. If you're testing locally, like we're doing, if you test in live server, then you won't get those errors. But if you're testing locally, you've got to load Chrome from your icon with this allow file access. Otherwise, it's a security thing on the canvas, not with just with Zim, but with any canvas library, 3JS, etc. Um, it made you know, people at Phaser, the game engine there, say, okay, no, we're not going to ever load just locally like that. We'll always have to load on a server. So you're trying to tell kids, hey, kids, sorry, we got to load it on a server. <laughs> and the kids are going, uh, what? So anyway, um, that all kind of happens. But... Here is the editor, the online editor's way to deal with kids because it's on a server and yet it's an online editor, it makes it easier. So that's another place it doesn't matter. But if you're good enough to know how to set the properties on your Chrome icon, you can do it that way. Or if you're on the Mac or on Firefox, you can follow these instructions, right? And that allows you to um, avoid those cores errors. So a little bit about tips. So careful reading of that if you're wanting to do assets will help you. All right, in conclusion, we've made lots of these falling games. Here's a couple examples. This one's a shooting one. So sometimes when things fall, you shoot. And there's a simple, like, oh, hit the space bar and it shoots up these little bullets and hits these things. It does add an extra bit of complexity, though. It's along the same lines of what we're doing. Now we have a container full of bullets. You have to loop through the bullets in the ticker and see if any of the bullets are hitting any of the targets. If you got a bunch of targets, you got to loop through all the targets, see if any of the bullets <laughs> are hitting that. So within the loop, you got another loop, and, and then you're checking each bullet against each target. That's how it's done. And then here's a Zimbits falling game. You can check that out. That was our Zimbits is 64 examples of basic uh, interactive media. That's what we're making here, interactive media. And one of those examples was a falling game with a little robber and some coins. And that was nice because if you catch the coins, you get a little reward. If you get caught by, if you get hit by a bomb, you get a little explosion, uh, etc. If you want to find out more about the canvas, there's your guide to the mechanics. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's your guide to coding creativity on the canvas. That is uh, in Medium as well. It's by me. And it tells you all about the canvas coding right from the beginning. And look, it gives you 13 other guides. If you want to know what frameworks or libraries to use, there's a guide for that. How to set up your coding environment with the template, there's a guide. 
what are these display objects? A guide. And a second one for components. There's so many. What are these conveniences that we're offering? Uh, how do you do interactivity? So dragging, tapping, hit test conditionals. Animation. Accessibility. How do you bring in assets? A guide. So a whole new guide on that. Style. Responsive and adaptive, a guide. And finally, controls like our motion controller, parallax, sound wave, physics, virtual reality. Okay, so uh, that's a big guide. And what we've done in this guide, so scrolling back down, what we've done in this guide is just a little summary of each one. Okay, so a little summary of that one. A little summary of display objects. A little summary of the components. Look at that for games. Imagine having uh, a UI for, for games and conveniences. The Zim Duo technique that we talked about, the Zim V value that we talked about, those are conveniences interactivity. Okay, anyway, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's that one. Um, if you're worried about creativity, there's your guide to the mechanics of creativity. And if we press on this one, this is how to use hierarchies. Uh, these are all hierarchies across different views of the hierarchy, mappings of them. And we can use creativity. You see these boxes? If we want to think outside the box, it's good to know what the box is. Right? And, then, and so it goes on to talk about that and um, follows the creativity framework. you got to learn all these documents right here. Isn't that cool? That's what went into making the creativity framework. There's a TEDx talk by that guy. And then we talk about context and content. And all this is a way that we can create, invent, and uh, be creative by knowing what we're doing. Okay, and so this is the mechanics of creativity. And this as well is a guide. So down below here, there's it breaks it into four parts. A guide to context, a guide to flexibility and creativity, content. So context and content. Context is what's outside a node. Content is what's inside. So it's really easy to understand that. And so we talk about both those. And then relevance, how to, how to apply relevance to it. So those are like mini guides in there. It's all based on the philosophy of nodism, okay, which you can take a look at, invented by this guy, inventor Dan Zen. So if you want to find out of him, you can. Whew. Uh, here is the last tutorial that we did on, oh no, this is the first tutorial that we did, isometric game. We also did a, um, what was the second one? Uh, side scroller. So there's a side scroller. We'll come in and add the link to the side scroller. It just got published today. Like just before we're doing this video, it just got published. So we'll put that in there. So we have a link to the side scroller as well. You're welcome to come and join us at the, uh-oh, <laughs> at the forum with a U. So Zim Forum and Discord. You need to update that. And I'm Dr. Abstract. Follow us at Twitter or on YouTube. Yay! <laughs> And this has been, oh my goodness, it kind of was a fun one, wasn't it? Did you like that? I hope you did. This has been a all you need for falling games. Uh, so this is a first, uh, third in the series. All you need to make HTML5 games, falling games with Dr. Abstract. Have a great day or night. And glad you're here with us. Please join us. If you've made it all the way through, that means you must be pretty enthusiastic about this. Come join us at the forum, at the forum. And that's where you can ask any questions, find out what else people have been making, and join us. We'd love to have you there. Cheers.